Hello, and welcome to the Fisher Investments Market Insights Podcast, where we discuss our firm's latest thinking on global capital markets and current events. My name is Naj Srinivas, and I'm the Group Vice President of Client Communications here at the firm. Today, we're going to dive into answering some common questions we've been receiving from listeners. There's been a lot of great topics to cover lately, so we're splitting this listener question session into two episodes. In part one today, we'll tackle questions about fears over government debt and the potential inflation impacts from the various government aid packages released to staunch the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic response. Watch out for part two in the coming weeks. So let's get started. To help us answer these questions, I'll introduce you to a few leaders at Fisher Investments, and we'll tap into their experience and expertise to get their perspectives on these issues. Thanks and enjoy the episode. A perennial question from listeners, investors, and Fisher Investments clients is whether or not they should be worried about government debt. In early 2008, over a decade ago, total U.S. government debt was just under $10 trillion. In June 2020, here today, that amount sits at just under $26 trillion. There's no question that the amount of government debt we have in the United States here today is very large and growing. But is it problematic? And will it have a negative impact on the stock market? Casey Ellis, Executive Vice President for U.S. Private Client Services, will be joining us to help answer this question. Casey is responsible for all U.S. private client relationships at Fisher Investments, so he interacts with clients and responds to questions just like this very regularly. Well, when it comes to government debt, I think what people are are primarily worried about are the government's inability or the potential for a government's inability, particularly in the U.S., to not be able to fund its various obligations or be able to meet its various obligations. And if I think back through my time at the firm, you know, I've been hosting client events now going back for almost 15 years. And I would say without a doubt, this is the number one most asked question over time. And it comes in lots of different forms. But I think you have concerns about the inability of government to meet obligations. You know, most of us have been taught over time that debt is bad and more debt is worse and less debt is good and no debt is ideal. And for the most part, that's not really accurate. But I think a lot of people just hear the word debt and worry what that might do to the government's obligation to pay. And the reason why the question around debt has come up so much more today, although it's always come up, is really, I think, tied in some ways to responses around COVID. There's a number of different policies that each government around the world have taken on in terms of borrowing money in order to fund a variety of different, what you think of as bailout packages, whether those are small business loans, whether they are state aid, whether they are even at the federal level aid. It's really about funding those sorts of programs, why you've seen a greater subscription to debt over the last few months, and why the question is more acute today than maybe it would have been six months ago. As we look for answers about the potential impacts of government debt, we'll primarily be looking at U.S. government debt. Why? Well, I'll let Casey explain. So U.S. debt is of primary concern really because it is one of the most popular, if not primary, debt instruments for all sorts of investors around the globe, be it actual investors or borrowers. Why is that? Well, one, it's extraordinarily liquid. Two, the U.S. government and the U.S. economic activity is incredibly diversified. It's not dependent on one or two small sectors or one or two small pieces of government. It's highly tradable. It's highly desired. One of the reasons why yields right now are so low on government bonds is, to some degree, is a function of demand, that when times are tougher or economic times are in question, as they certainly are right now, there certainly tends to be a greater demand for U.S. bonds, just given the liquidity and safety of those relative to maybe some other fixed debt obligations available globally. As I mentioned at the top of the show, the U.S. government's public debt amounts to just about $26 trillion. But the biggest owner of the federal government's debt is the federal government itself. Various agencies, such as the Social Security Administration and even the Forest Service. Now, if you looked at things from an accounting standpoint, something that exists as both an asset and a liability on the government's balance sheet effectively cancels. You can't owe yourself money. So most analysts in the investment industry will subtract out the amount of debt that the government owes itself. That figure is called net public debt. But regardless of gross or net, we don't think those big numbers themselves are the things investors should be focused on. 
KC again to explain. Now, we don't think total dollar value or absolute value of outstanding debt is the right thing to be worried about. And it is a scary number. Let's be very clear about that. I think right now the amount of outstanding net debt here in the United States is something like plus or minus $20 trillion, which is a big number, of course. But I think whether you think about it as government debt or you think about your own personal debt, it's really smart to think about debt, one, as a function of your overall assets your overall income, but also, and probably most importantly, it's not so much your outstanding debt, but it's your ability to service that debt or pay the interest on the debt that is what people really ought to be focused on versus the top line number, which can be very scary. So setting aside the top line debt number, the next logical step is to look for a measure of debt affordability. And one place to start is by comparing debt or debt servicing costs to gross domestic product or GDP. You'll often hear it cited in the media that debt to GDP ratios are higher than they've ever been or as high as they've been in a multitude of years, whatever it happens to be. It's really not the right way to look at it for a few reasons, maybe that are a little bit more technical. One, if you just think about GDP, what GDP measures is annual economic activity, whereas debt is more of an accumulated number. So really from a comparison standpoint, you're kind of talking about apples to oranges. And then further, if you think about what's a more appropriate measurement for debt or a comparison point for debt. It's really about the interest payments themselves, what you have to pay in order to service the debt relative to something like your tax revenue. Think about your mortgage. You don't really think about the outstanding mortgage so much as you think about your ability to pay your mortgage relative to your income in a calendar year or a month or a quarter, whatever it happens to be. As Casey says, if you're focusing on the ability of the government to afford its debt, then we think that comparing against tax revenue, essentially the government's income, is a better measure to focus on. And what do those measures tell us about U.S. government debt today? Well, current affordability measures tell us that U.S. debt right now currently is pretty cheap. And really from the standpoint of the cost of servicing debt as a percentage of no matter how you look at it, tax revenues, GDP, overall economic activity, really the U.S. doesn't have much of a debt problem at all. If you just think about the yield right now on a 10-year bond being materially less than 1%, even a 30-year bond being something like a percent and a half, those are extraordinarily low borrowing costs. Lower interest rates can often help the government afford its debt. As old debt matures, the government usually pays back the principal amount to investors by issuing new debt, like refinancing your mortgage. You get the same amount outstanding, you're just paying a different interest rate now. And The current low interest rate can effectively lower the cost that the government pays on its debt. I tend to think about in late May, there was a bond auction at the federal level for 30-year bonds. And what had happened during that period is that in May, you had almost $10 billion in 30-year bonds that were matured. So that means that those bonds were issued in, what, 1990. The interest rate on those bonds was 8.875%. So if you just think about that from a payment standpoint, that means that the federal government over time paid out about $2,600 per bond. That's the coupon payment over a 30-year period. This most recent tranche of bonds that was issued in May, which was about $30 billion, had a 1.25% coupon attached to it, which means that over the next 30 years, the U.S. will only pay out about $375 per bond over that period, which is very, very cheap and very, very inexpensive relative to the bonds you just can't do. Whether you look at it as a percentage of revenue, a percentage of tax revenue, or you just think about it kind of intuitively in terms of refinancing old debt for new debt today, almost all of the debt we refinance now with any kind of length or maturity on that is going to be much, much cheaper than what has otherwise matured. Understanding that the United States can very easily afford its current debt load Investors like you are probably wondering what the impact of government debt is on stocks and what you need to do in your investment portfolios. We would say probably not very much. Right now, as we talked about, the government's current ability to service our debt or pay the interest is not in question. It's it's not, not a problem. Now, of course, that could change. And the ways that it could change would be that the amount of outstanding debt goes up to such a high level that the totality of the coupon payments becomes too high or that interest rates rise materially from here. But the reality is what people oftentimes forget about is that those are not instantaneous factors. They generally play out over time. And we've talked for a long time about this concept of something called the three and 30 rule. The three and 30 rule is really 
thinking about the market being a very efficient discounter of known information, but there's a limitation to what the market will discount. Anything that's within three months, the likelihood is that's already been more than discounted into pricing and is already well known. And anything that's more than about 30 months, maybe even three years out, there's just too many things that are out there in the offing for us to spend too much time worrying about it. And you really, unless you're in that three to 30 month you know, sweet spot, there, there's just not a lot of sense of worry. So how does that equate to debt? Well, it equates to debt from the standpoint that let's just take interest rates, for example. If interest rates were to rise materially from here, which I suppose is a possibility, it's not as if the interest rate on all of the debt that the U.S. government holds or that other people hold goes up immediately. It's just that the interest rate on new debt increases. And so if you think about all of those trillions of dollars in debt obligations that the U.S. government holds today, that has an interest rate that right now is really locked in and fixed. It's not until you get through the cycle a bit and start issuing new debt to replace old debt that higher interest rates become a problem, which is most likely well far out beyond that three and 30 threshold. And from our standpoint, those are just the sorts of things that we really can't spend too much time worrying about. Another topic we get a lot of questions about is inflation or the general rise of prices in an economy. To help us unpack recent questions about inflation fears, we talked to Wendy Nicholson. Wendy is a program manager in our private client group and spends a lot of time presenting to clients answering questions about current events or other market happenings. Oftentimes, investors, especially ones now that might be at or in close to or in retirement, are worried about inflation because they're thinking back to a time where many of them were doing things like getting settled into their careers, maybe having children, buying their first home. Of course, I'm talking about the 1970s, a time of high inflation. And really, inflation hasn't been that high since then. But that's the point of reference that folks at retirement age often go back to. On top of that, we've got this year, the government increasing lending, increasing liquidity in response to the COVID pandemic. Whenever the government increases those types of things, there's fear of money supply growing, which in turn brings inflation concerns. So let's be clear for a moment. In macroeconomic terms, some moderate inflation is generally accepted as a good thing. It's a sign of a growing economy. It's a sign of a productive economy and of greater demand, liquidity, and potentially rising incomes. Most economists today believe that about 2% inflation for developed countries is a good thing. And at that level, inflation hasn't been a problem for a very long time in the United States, as Wendy mentioned. But higher inflation can be damaging for savers or investors near or in retirement. If you're living off your savings, inflation can erode purchasing power over time if your assets need to last you 20 or 30 years in retirement. So from that personal finance perspective, inflation can always be a problem that an investor needs to factor into their planning. But before we get into what to do, let's talk about where inflation comes from so we have a better understanding of how to react to it. How inflation propagates, relates to the economy, to individuals. I like talking to investors about this because whether you're in the realm of finance day to day or not, we all can kind of hearken back to some type of economics class in maybe high school, maybe university, where you learn about the famous economist Milton Friedman. And in his wise words, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. It's too much money chasing too few goods. When investors or sometimes headlines are talking about inflation, it's usually not the full picture. It's usually either too much money that's focused on or we as individuals go to the store and see a higher price on something and think, oh, we've got inflation. But neither of those really paints that true picture of what Milton Friedman describes. Too much money chasing too few goods. And what the COVID pandemic has brought has been increases in fiscal and monetary policy, potentially more money alongside slowing business output. So the big questions from investors now are, 
is there the potential for too much money to chase too few goods? And what should we do about it? With recent fiscal stimulus in the U.S., combined with businesses slowing or shutting down and maybe creating less goods and services, the fear does become a little more real. But from what we can see right now, how the Fed has stepped in with programs to try to get funds to businesses that consumers can't get to in the short term, maybe it's not a perfect wash, but it probably cancels a lot of the concerns that true inflation will come. In other words, from what we can tell, as long as things continue to open up rather than shut down, the way that the Fed has helped bridge the gap for certain businesses, goods, services can get us from a point of too much money chasing too few goods to, okay, maybe there's some more money, but we've still got goods here to work with. Right now, we would encourage folks not to be too concerned with inflation because it does look like our government and hopefully even globally, as you start to see packages in Europe get discussed, for example, that they understand the real risk of inflation if these things aren't done right. And for the most part, we're comfortable with how things have been laid out and don't think that inflation will be a direct result of it and certainly wouldn't encourage folks to change how they're invested or how they view the future based on this. From a macroeconomic perspective, we at Fisher Investments don't think there's currently an inflation problem in the United States. And inflation isn't poised to tank stock markets. But now we have to look at that question from the point of view of a saver or an investor who's at or nearing retirement, a situation that many of our clients find themselves in. And for that, I'm going to bring back Casey Ellis to help provide some perspective. There's a lot of different ways to answer this, but I think the primary way to answer it is that that probably means for those who need to be worried about loss of purchasing power, that they need to be more dominantly weighted towards equities or stocks than other investments. You know, stocks have very reliably over longer periods of time, certainly as short as 20, but but once you get out to things like 30 or even 35 years, there's really never been a period of time where stocks have, one, not been positive, but two, have also not been positive and above and beyond the return of inflation during that period of time. So stocks really are the best ultimate hedge towards inflation in the long run. A big thanks to Casey Ellis and Wendy Nicholson for sharing their insights with us on these listener questions about government debt and inflation. In part two, we'll look at what a potential second wave of COVID-19 might mean for markets. We'll also look at an investor phenomenon we like to call break-evenitis. And we'll also answer questions about whether gold makes a good investment during turbulent times. If you have a question for our next listener mailbag, please send them to us at marketinsights at fi.com. And if you like what you heard today, please rate and subscribe to this podcast wherever you may be listening to it. You can also follow Fisher Investments on the major social media channels, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. And you can find our Fisher Investments channel on YouTube as well. For our latest capital markets insights, check out the Market Minder section of our website, fisherinvestments.com. We'll talk to you again in a couple of weeks with part two of our listener questions episode. Until then, I'm Naj Srinivas. Stay safe and be well. Thanks for listening.